My members whom I've been speaking to, not about their businesses chart, but in fact, so many of them are involved in philanthropic activities in their communities, many of whom are with hospital boards, hospital foundations. They're the ones who reached out to me over three, four weeks ago and said, Goldie, we need to kill the dragon at its head. We have a health emergency. We need to show and provide governments with confidence and cover that we believe a controlled economic shutdown of non-essential services would help mitigate this crisis. And Good afternoon, Gerard and Goldie. And hello to everyone out there in the Ivy community and beyond. I'm Mark Healy. I'm the executive director of the Ivy Academy, the learning and development wing of Ivy Business School in London. Gerard, this is the second important interview we're doing today. Earlier, we spoke with Goldie's friend and colleague, Perrin Beattie. We talked about the three guiding principles. The, the first one, actually, that we're using right now, which is to be as helpful as possible during these times. So that's the school, our clients, the broader market. And to try to do it in a humble way as a business school, of course, we know we're not on the front lines like our healthcare workers are. And we thank them for that. This session is one in a series of perspectives we're trying to get and to share in, in what I know this is an overused buzzword right now, but it, it is accurate in unprecedented times. So Gerard Seitz, for those of you uh, that know him, really doesn't need a, a big introduction, but I'm going to do a short one anyway. Gerard is the executive director of the Ian O. Yanitowicz Institute for Leadership, and he holds the Yanitowicz Chair in Leadership at Ivy. He's one of our leadership gurus, and he's one of the more colorful characters we have around the school. So, Gerard, thanks very much for doing this. And Gerard and I today are, are really lucky to be joined by Goldie Hyder, another great Canadian with a long and decorated resume in business and the nonprofit sector. Mr. Hyder is currently President and Chief Executive Officer of the Business Council of Canada. Founded in 1976, the council is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization representing the chief executives and heads of 150 leading, leading Canadian businesses. Mr. Hyder is past president and CEO of Hill and Knowlton Strategies, providing strategic communications and counsel to the firm's extensive and diverse client base. In addition to his achievements in business and public policy, Goldie has a long track record of service on behalf of several charities and nonprofits. He's past co-chair of the United Ways of Ottawa campaign cabinet and a former member of the Board of Governors at Carleton University. Goldie's a regular commentator in the Canadian media on business, politics, and leadership. He's the host of the recently launched Speaking of Business podcast, which we would encourage you to check out. It features interviews from Canadian innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. In 2013, he received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in recognition of his contributions to Canada. He holds a Master of Arts in Public Policy from the University of Calgary. And so, Goldie, even though you have some close ties to some schools in Ottawa and Calgary, we won't hold it against you here. And uh, we thank you very much for, for joining us today. Gerard, over to you, please. I'm worried. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark, and uh, and thank you, uh, thank you, Goldie. Um, Goldie, before we go into the uh, the questions, um, I want to thank you uh, just as uh, as Mark did for your time. I know that, uh, like many uh, Canadians in in leadership positions, you're exceptionally busy working working on behalf of uh, Canadian businesses and the many uh, Canadians that they uh, that they employ. And so, the first question I actually like to ask you: uh, How are you doing? And uh, importantly, how's your family doing? Well, thank you, Gerard, for the question, and uh, right back at you. Uh, look, this is a surreal time for uh, us all. Um, you know, we're very fortunate. I think uh, it's safe to say that, unfortunately, this is a virus that has a discriminatory impact on socioeconomic situations, and many of us are fortunate to be in a situation where we're able to get our family together and uh, take care uh, of each other. Uh, but let's face it, there is impact in everybody's lives. In some way, shape, or form, this is going to be consequential, I feel, for those people who are going to miss out on their graduations or things like that. My own daughter has an internship that she had to not be able to go to Thailand for. My eldest one was about to start a new career three weeks in, laid off because she was in events planning. So it hits home directly and indirectly. I think that, um, you know, we all have to rely on that great Canadian spirit of resiliency and, and fight through it. Yeah, yeah. Goldie, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, the Business Council of, uh, of Canada. Uh, what is the Business Council of Canada? What does your day look like during the pandemic? And specifically, uh, what are your objectives? Who do you talk to? And what are you hearing from the front lines? Well, as Mark alluded to, this is an organization with a long history. 
uh, over 150 CEOs representing about half the Toronto Stock Exchange and Marcap. Uh, directly in, uh, employ roughly 1.7 to 2 million Canadians. And a multiple we use of at least four, Gerard, and, uh, in terms of the small business and the supply chain that exists because of, uh, uh, of these large, uh, large businesses being here uh, in Canada. And you'll see that reflected in the way in which we approach public policy making, which I know we'll talk about. We try and partner with other organizations to say this is not about big business versus anyone else. We're, we're in this together. We were in this together before the virus and we'll be in together uh, after it. We have a small but mighty advocacy team. Our focus is very advocacy driven, trying to provide governments uh, of all uh, stripes and of all jurisdictions the best policy uh, advice that we can. And certainly these days we're at it seven days a week as I suspect many are around the country. Uh, basically a phone attached to my ear or I'm doing Zoom as I am uh, with you. And, and, and for the most part we're speaking with, as you can imagine, we're speaking with our members uh, who give us a real handle on how are they responding to this COVID crisis. Uh, we're speaking to government, both federal and provincial, both bureaucrats as well as our, our politically elected officials. Very focused on the cabinet committee led by Christia Freeland and uh, Minister Duclo who have been really great with their outreach, um, talking about how members can add value to some of the challenges that they're facing, both from a policy making perspective, but also from a response to the healthcare crisis that we're facing that I'm sure we're going to touch on. Speak with premiers uh, on a regular basis. I'm actually hearing a lot from healthcare uh, workers and healthcare uh, administrators in particular, because we forget, uh, while we might get focused on the economic crisis, the reality is we have a health emergency. We need to deal with the health emergency. So dealing with stakeholders and associations and labor. Uh, this is a time where, you know, that hashtag in this together could, could never be further from, uh, there is, is, is more, never more truer words have been spoken. I mean, we are truly uh, in this together. And our focus is first and foremost, Chart, about saving lives. I think we should recognize that what this is about is um, uh, making sure that no one has to, uh, no, no one that needs, uh, no one who finds himself in the situation of dying alone and dying in pain and away from their family should ever have to go through that. And so as business leaders, our focus has been save lives, save jobs, you know, save the economy, but let, but do it together. Let's work together in doing that. Yeah. Um, Goldie, you became uh, the CEO of the Business Council of Canada in 2018. And as Mark already explained, uh, prior to that time, you were the president and CEO of Hill Knowlton Strategies, a uh, public relations company. Mm -hmm. In the midst of the pandemic now, COVID-19, uh, are there any particular skills that you have to rely on that were, or that you really picked up on as the, the CEO at, at Hill and Knowlton? Well, it wouldn't come as a surprise that a former public relations, uh, you know, a practitioner puts the emphasis of communications yeah. front and center uh, at the time uh, of a crisis. Uh, this is a time for our leaders to provide us with reassurance, to provide us with uh, a sense of, of a direction, a sense of purpose, a sense that, you know, um, Things are gonna be better, yes, but here's all the things that, that need to happen to get there. Uh, my experience has been, and I've, I've had the line of sight of working with some of Canada's finest crisis communicators dealing with from health crises to plane crashes to uh, energy sector issues. And, you know, uh, we've, we've had, I've had a chance to see how they work. And, and as I said, communications is first and foremost uh, uh, at the top of the list here. But so too is authenticity. Uh, leadership of integrity, leadership with values, leadership of honesty, leadership of humanity, and one that acknowledges that I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers to everything. I'm, 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 I'm going to make mistakes uh, uh, as we go forward here. But that trust that is gained is what the communications is about. So the communications is the tactic, but the intent underneath it is gaining trust gaining trust and confidence. And I think that comes from clear, decisive leadership. I think it comes from bold leadership. Uh, my message publicly has been that you will not be punished for overshooting, for overreacting, for over-responding, but history might judge you weakly, uh, you know, as being weak if you underestimated, if you under-responded, if you, you know, were tepid uh, in the way in which we're going forward. And so that's an important lesson. And the second one I will just say is the importance of collaboration uh, with stakeholders. Uh, anytime you're in a crisis, you have a stakeholder crisis communications plan. It can't be done in a vacuum. It can't be done in a bubble. You don't do it in the C-suite and you shouldn't do it in the, in the PMO or the prime premier's office or, or the mayor's office for that matter. You need to collaborate uh, with, your, with your shareholders and your stakeholders. And there's no shame in bringing people in. I think it's a sign of strength 
to say, hey, we don't have all the answers. Let's surround ourselves with smart people and figure out what we can do and do it together. And I think what that does is it, it gives confidence to the public that says, okay, people who know what they're doing are working on this and I should listen to what they're saying to me. How do you feel Actually, about what you're, sorry, sorry, sorry. How do you feel about what you're seeing at their goalie from, from business and from politicians? Well, look, um, let's first acknowledge that what our, what we're seeing today or what we're going through today is an, is an unprecedented event in our lifetime. Unless you were there in 1918 when the, when the, when the Spanish flu happened, you know, you, you, you don't know how to respond to this. And I am uh, very appreciative and very grateful for our public servants, uh, for our healthcare workers and our political leaders across the country in all levels of government and all stripes. No one signed up for this. No one has, a, you know, the ability to manage this uh, on their own. And I think that, that but um, this is all. This is a moment in which not only are leaders uh, having to learn about the situation, but I think the country. I think this is a moment, and you know, I've spoken before at Ivy about this. But we've been pretty lucky to be Canadians. Our culture has allowed us to be fairly comfortable and 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 and, and to some extent complacent. But a crisis doesn't align well with that approach of comfort and complacency. And I think that one of the frustrations that I'm certainly feeling, and I, and I don't say this lightly because I don't think in a crisis, um, you, you know, you want to reassess everything in the middle of a crisis. But when lives are at stake, I think it's fair game to say, have we learned anything in how we behaved in the last three, four weeks? And my sense is we should. Um, this virus didn't sneak up on us. It didn't surprise us. It's already been making a world tour in other parts of the world. We know exactly how it behaves. We know what it does. I think our preparedness and our readiness and our and our reaction with greater urgency uh, would have been better. Um, I think we acted uh, what I would describe as quintessentially Canadian in being uh, cautious, uh, in respecting jurisdictions, in, in, in saying that it's a big country, we can't have one set of rules. I think we need one set of rules. You know, yeah. uh, let me push uh, on, on a couple of things that you uh, that you said, if I may. And so let me go to uh, one of the blogs, one of several blogs that you that you wrote over the last couple of weeks. And here's a direct quote. We must acknowledge that our political leaders and public servants who work tirelessly for the country have gotten more than they bargained for. The COVID-19 crisis is an unprecedented event. So let me ask you this question, Goldie. Based on what you've seen in Canada and the leadership in the public, private, and the not-for-profit sectors, what sets the truly excellent leaders apart from the good ones? You know, I, I go back to authenticity. I go back to authenticity as being um, absolutely key here. Um, people want to have confidence. People want to believe that their leaders are telling them the whole truth and nothing but the truth, that they're doing everything that they can to, to help solve the problem, and they're not holding back in any way. And I think transparency, honesty, uh, decisiveness, these are the kind of character traits. And you look back to the Churchill example, of course, we all talk about in the World War and so forth. You, you, you have to have the ability to put people on your shoulder and give them the sense that I'm going to get you through this. I'm going to carry you forward. But that, that um, um, humanity of acknowledging that I can't do it by myself, that I need the support of a lot of people around me and that, yeah, I might make some mistakes and that's okay. I think that confidence that comes with that is something that Canadians are, are, are looking for at this time. Yeah, I find this all very intriguing because, um, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the trust deficit, right, in, in leaders, both in government and business. If you look at the Edelman Trust Survey, for example, the numbers don't always look good. And so, you know, the 2020 survey that was released a few months ago, you know, revealed that more than 50 percent of, of those individuals surveyed uh, citizens believe that capitalism as it exists today does more harm than good in the world, right? And yet at this moment in time, we really look up to kind of the CEOs, people in leadership positions to make a positive difference, right? And so I think the issue around leadership is, uh, is critically important in a situation uh, like this. Well, let's first acknowledge that that survey that you refer to, Canada, <laughs> actually in that survey, unlike other countries, yeah. Um, Canadians disagreed with that statement that capitalism as it exists today does more harm than, than, than good. So Canadians actually have confidence 
in our approach of trying to balance private sector and public sector. We are a country and a history of a country where we want to promote the private sector, the investment, the wealth creation, but we also look at our social side. We look at how it is that that, that growth and economic prosperity is being shared by those who don't have the same level of access to it. And of course, I'm referring to our social programs here. Our social programs are funded, supported, and built upon the success of the economic growth that we're able to enjoy. And so I think we should take great solace in the fact that Canadians actually have tremendous confidence uh, in their CEOs, are actually calling on us to lead. Uh, I would suggest to you that where Canadians are consistent with others around the world is their view that there is too much uh, hyper partisanship in politics, and that they would prefer to see a, a quintessential Canadian approach of trying to build some consensus uh, and finding that common uh, common ground. So I, I think we're in a better place, uh, Gerard, than most uh, are in different parts of the world. It's a work in progress. We need to do more, and there's no question that coming out of this crisis, uh, businesses and governments are going to have to really chart a course forward as to how to protect and preserve that culture that, that, that taking care of each other while trying to grow an economy, which is going to be um, having just gone through what likely will be double digit, um, double digit unemployment, triple digit or nine digits worth of, of, uh, of deficit or 10 digits worth of deficit, um, you know, or growing debt. We're going to have to figure out how to work together. And this is no time to divide and conquer big business against labor or against small business or one government against another. I think that hashtag in this together, it continues after this crisis is over. So let me push you on that as well, if I may, because you invoked this word collaboration a little earlier in our, in our conversation. But the reality also is that observers um, who discuss the importance of collaboration or coordinated leadership across the public, private, not-for-profit sector, they have observed that uh, there's, there's much room for improvement. This coordination doesn't always happen. It's obvious, but it doesn't always happen. So what might get in the way of such collaboration and what would it take to identify solutions together going forward? So um, at the risk of being un-Canadian, I'm going to disagree with the premise of your first question, Gerard, because I actually think we have examples of where uh, businesses didn't even wait for governments to tell them what to do. They just went ahead and did it. You know, and the best example of that is on PPEs, you know, the personal protective equipment that is necessary for our healthcare workers. Uh, I will tell you that my own response to this crisis has been shaped primarily by my members whom I've been speaking to, not about their businesses, Gerard. But in fact, so many of them are involved in philanthropic activities in their communities, many of whom are with hospital boards, hospital foundations. They're the ones who reached out to me over three, four weeks ago and said, Goldie, we need to kill the dragon at its head. We have a health emergency. We need to show and provide governments with confidence and cover that we believe a controlled economic shutdown of non-essential services would help mitigate this crisis. And so we've actually, I think, been bold and, um, and out there in saying to governments, do the big things, do the tough stuff, and we have your back. Um, you don't have to worry about the political fallout of this or how the media reports this. Now, just throw that stuff away. History will remember you if you went big and you went, and you went bold. And I think on that front, businesses have been responding to both the issue of the healthcare workers, but also I will tell you the message I hear most from my members today. And you have to remember, anytime you're in a business, if revenues fall, your instincts go to where? Cut costs, right? Not in this situation. I have spoken with over 60 plus members so far of my membership. And what I hear from them universally, consistently is, here's, first of all, I wanna keep my employees. I wanna do everything I can to retain my talent because before this virus came, the issue that kept me up at night is how do I keep my talent? Mm -hmm. And so we, we wanna make sure that people realize that our recommendations to government at this time have been keep it simple, no need to create new programs, you know, let's look at what other countries have done, pay the employers to pay the employees the EI portion, keep them on the payroll, you know, don't uh, lay them off to put them through the emotional and psychological impact that has, maintain their benefits. This is what I hear from my members. I'm, I am a voice, you know, a voice of our members. I don't make this stuff up. This is what business leaders in Canada are saying to me to say to our government and to say to our media and our business leaders in, in other parts of the country, this is what we should be focusing on, saving lives, saving jobs.
So Goldie, that's a very positive message and it makes me, makes me very happy. Um, from a business point of view and in your role as the, the CEO, what are you most disappointed about so far? Where can we do much, much better? Yeah, I, I, look, I, first of all, I think we should all be surprised to learn um, that Canada doesn't make almost any of the protective equipment that it needs. And so one of the things that's going to come out of this is there's no way we're ever going to let our healthcare system get held hostage. As you saw the day we're taping this, the president announced that he would prefer that 3M doesn't send any uh, masks and vent and masks uh, up here to Canada. Uh, luckily, <laughs> that's an, an, an order that I think will be um, um, not followed uh, here by the company in Canada, and we're going to continue to to make sure that the needs of healthcare workers are met. So I think that realization that wow, somehow we let the country get away from doing critical manufacturing that needs to be done, I think that um, that will be addressed. Um, look, I, as I said earlier, for me, the, the lesson here is um, let's make sure that we honor the lives of those that, that, are, that, are, that are dying in this, in this, uh, in this tragedy mm -hmm. by, by learning the lessons here and applying them so that we are ready to not have to go through this kind of a situation again. Um, I am a proud Canadian, as, as, as you know, and I, and I hope your listeners uh, have, have seen. Um, you know, we're running these podcasts right now, uh, very short podcasts with CEOs on the COVID crisis. It's at speakingofbiz.ca, that's biz with a Z. Uh, I invite your, you and your listeners to, to, to listen because what you're seeing and what you'll, or what you'll hear, excuse me, on these podcasts is leadership in action. What is it that leaders are doing to take the situation, learn from it on the fly? I think one of the dangers we face right now is we want to wait for this to conclude and then someone will write a master's thesis or a PhD thesis. I don't think that should be the case. I think we need to be learning real time what is working, what is not working, and how do we course correct so we can save lives, save jobs, save the supply chain, and save our economy in the long run. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, final question here, uh, Goldie. Um, what is the uh, your final message to all those individuals that are watching the recording? And so, uh, as the CEO of the Business Council of Canada, or perhaps in your words, as an ordinary yet very proud Canadian, what is the one key message you would like to leave them with that is very action-oriented, where we all can make a difference? Yeah, look, I, I can't help but underscore what the Prime Minister and our Premiers are saying every single day. First and foremost, take this seriously. This is real. It's not going to be, uh, you know, treat Canadians differently than it is others around the world. So take this seriously. There will be sacrifices. I have bunkered in here thinking I'm probably here for the next 90 days. We, we don't know. We don't know how long this is going to take. We also know two other things. One, there is an end. We will get through this. There will be uh, a new beginning of whatever the new normal is. But understand, and this is the second point, life may not be the same. Life will be different. But I think that the actions that we take, the choices that we make, uh, and, and the abilities that we can show to, to be bold, be creative, uh, and shake ourselves from the shackles of comfort, complacency, we can come out of this stronger we can come out of this better. We can come out of this more resilient. Uh, so let's learn from this, because as I said, there's no better way to honor the lives that are being lost than to ensure that, that, that the learning that needs to take place is taking place. And I'm, I'm very confident that that is going to happen at all levels. And it's why I'm so delighted and honored to have been uh, here today with all of you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Goldie, very much uh, for your time. Much appreciated. Uh, Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you to, uh, to bring it to a close, please. I just wanted to echo what, what Gerard said. We don't we don't take it uh, lightly that you found some time for us. We know you're incredibly busy just interfacing with business and government at all times. So on behalf of the Ivy community, thank you so much to, to you for, for sharing your perspective. Well, thank you for having me. As you know, we have a close connection with Linda Hasenfratz, our, our your chancellor, is our yes. former board chair here at the Business Council. So thank you for what uh, all of you are doing to get this message out. We appreciate your support and leadership. Okay, thank you, Goldie. Thank you.